Salutations! The Halo CE Weapons tier list video really popped off, and there has been overwhelming support for me to continue on with Halo 2. Like with the CE video, we'll be doing two lists, one for the campaign and another for multiplayer, since both modes are entirely different ecosystems to each other. Since there's quite a few more weapons in Halo 2 than in CE, this will be a two-parter, with the campaign being talked about in this video, followed by the multiplayer component in the next video. The weapons will be judged on their performance during a solo, legendary run, with no skulls enabled. This will show the true strength of Halo 2's weaponry as they go against enemies that have more health and shields than they do on lower difficulties. Halo 2 does things differently from Halo 1 with its difficulty-based health values for the AI. Halo 1 handled this through a global health and shield multiplier, which increased every enemy AI's health and shield by 40% on Legendary. Now, Halo 2 handles this on a character-by-character -character basis, with each AI having specific health values for Legendary. For example, Minor Grunts in Halo 1 had 30 health points. Since Halo 1 buffs enemy health by 40% on Legendary, their health value becomes 42. In Halo 2, Minor Grunts have 25 health points on Normal, while their Legendary value is 40, which is actually a 60% buff compared to their Normal stat. One more example is the Elite. A Minor Elite has 70 shield points and 30 health points on Normal, but on Legendary, he has 105 shield points and 45 health points, which is a 50% boost for both. This system is now the standard for Halo titles going forward. A few comments from the last video felt I should be judging these lists based off of Heroic instead of Legendary. And let me tell you why I disagree with this. I don't feel that the rankings would change all that much regardless if I play on Heroic or Legendary. The best weapons are still going to be preferred over the lesser ones. I also want to see if a weapon has aged well from the lower difficulties to the highest in the game, to truly see how well a weapon is designed overall. If a weapon is truly good, it should be able to take on Legendary, right? Halo 2 has quite a few more enemy types than in Halo 1. Our returning Covenant cast members are Grunts, Jackals, Elites, and Hunters. The Flood brought back the Infection Forms, Combat Forms, and Carrier Forms. The Sentinel Aggressors make a return as well. Within these factions, new characters are introduced. The Covenant gain Drones, as well as Brutes. And the Sentinels introduce the Enforcer. Like I said in the previous tier list video, there aren't nearly as many vehicle encounters in the game compared to infantry. When enemy vehicles are present, you'll also have a vehicle of your own, which has infinite ammo to take them down. And most of the vehicle encounters in Halo 2 are skippable anyway. With all that in mind, when I rank the weapons, their matchup into vehicles won't make as much of an impact as other factors, with some exceptions that I'll get into later. Most of the time, you can only carry two weapons at a time, and I prefer to use weapons that are more versatile for a longer period of time than those that have niche uses. Halo 2 introduced a way for you to carry a third weapon around, dual wielding. This lets the player carry one weapon in their right hand and another in their left hand. Dual wielding gives the player a significant DPS boost with two weapons being fired instead of just one. However, there are quite a few drawbacks in place for dual wielding that prevent it from being too overpowered. Not every weapon in the game can be dual wielded. Only six weapons have this ability, which include the Magnum, the SMG, the Plaza Pistol, both Plasma Rifle variants, and the greatest weapon of all time, the Needler. Needler gang. There are also damage and accuracy debuffs that are applied to your weapons when both triggers are held at the same time. You can get around these debuffs by holding one trigger at a time, and I'll talk about some of the better combinations a bit later. While you dual wield, you can't throw grenades at all, locking you out of a core piece of Halo's Golden Triangle. Sometimes, reload speeds are also significantly slower. Lastly, you can melee and enter vehicles while you dual wield, but these actions will make you drop the weapon in your left hand, significantly nerfing your DPS when you begin firing again. Melee attacks will no longer play much of a factor at all in this tier list, 
with a few exceptions that I'll bring up later in the video. The unique mechanics associated with Halo 1's melee system are no longer present. Some melee animations were faster and had longer ranges than others in Halo 1. In Halo 2, melee animations play at about the same speed now, and can be performed even faster with a BXB glitch. You can also lunge into targets with melee attacks, giving all weapons the exact same melee range. Another new feature Halo 2 pioneered is weapon trading. You're able to trade your weapons with your friendly NPCs, and this is a great way to customize the squad you're in. The best part is the AI will never run out of ammo nor do they have to reload, so they can just spam the hell out of their weapons with no drawbacks. Asterisk. One more aspect I like to mention is weapon damage multipliers. Halo 1's weapons had specific multipliers that were mostly native to each weapon, such as the assault rifle's bullets doing 70% of their damage to elite shields, while shotgun pellets did 100% damage to their shields. Halo 2 greatly simplifies this by introducing a global damage table. In Halo 2's globals, the damage table includes a list of damage models that offer various multipliers versus specific materials like energy shields, flood flesh, sentinel armor, etc. The weapon damage in Halo 2 points to this global damage table by referencing one of the damage models included there. As I go through the tier list, I'll talk about each of these damage models as they come up and show what they offer for the weapons using them. Big shout out to Scruffy to Sasquatch for compiling an Excel sheet that organizes all of these damage models in a visually coherent way, much better than scrolling through them in Gorilla. If you want to see this for yourself, I'll have a link in the description. With all of that out of the way, let's finally begin ranking Halo 2's weapons as they stand in the campaign. Like with CE's list, the order that I'll be tackling these weapons will correspond to when you first find them in the campaign. The very first weapon that appears is the descendant of Halo 1's assault rifle, the SMG. It has a 60 round magazine, fires at 15 rounds per second, and its projectiles have a maximum range of 40 world units. The SMG can carry 180 spare rounds and 360 while dual wielding two of them. Ammo is common, found in the hands of marines and flood combat forms, as well as appearing in most ammo caches. It dishes out 4.75 damage per bullet, using the damage type Bullet Slow, which is notable for being neutral into many targets in the game. Exceptions include the Brutes, which are 50% resistant, the Flood, which take 25% more damage, and Hunter Flesh, which takes double damage against Bullet Slow. Its firing spread ranges from 1 degree to 2.75 degrees, which is typically wider than average, but for full auto at 15 rounds per second, that's not bad. When dual wielding, the SMG receives a 25% damage reduction while both triggers are held. Accuracy slightly worsens with dual fire, with a spread ranging from 1.5 degrees to 3 degrees. It has good dual wield synergy with the plaza pistol and plasma rifle, as both can drain elite shields while the SMG finishes them off. With all that said, the SMG is not great. Its biggest drawback is its low DPS. Compared to Halo 1's assault rifle, the SMG isn't even half as strong. To be fair, since Halo 2's elites aren't as tanky as their Halo 1 counterparts, the SMG takes them on just as well as the AR did to Halo 1's elites. Just don't use this against Ultras. The big deal, however, is when the SMG goes up against Grunts. What made the CE AR so good was how well it could clear out whole squads of Grunts with little effort. The SMG can't do this nearly as well, especially when using just one. The health values for Halo 2's grunts aren't that far off from CE's, meaning it takes the SMG more time to kill them compared to the assault rifle. To make matters worse, grunts can upgrade to the new Ultra rank, which has much more health than majors. So much can happen to you on Legendary in this extra time it takes to kill grunts, when you could just kill them faster with the game's other options. If the SMG has anything over CE's AR, it's the higher accuracy when firing full auto which can be useful for picking off weak targets from distances you wouldn't expect. What brings the SMG down the most for me is how outclassed it is against just about everything in the game. It matches up decently into Hunters, Drones, Flood Forms, and Standard Sentinels, but there's so many weapons in the game that takes these enemies on much better than it. Shielded Jackals are harder to hit, but are stun-locked when body shots land. The SMG also has vertical recoil, something that players don't have to compensate for when using any other weapon in the game. 
I will say that SMGs are not that bad in the hands of friendly AI. They can stun unshielded Covenant and provide decent shield chip into elites. Overall, I feel the SMG is a C-tier weapon. It's a small fish in a big pond. It's not entirely unusable, but there aren't many reasons to use the SMG over other options. The very next weapon is the Battle Rifle, and do I have a lot to say about the Battle Rifle. It's the descendant of the CE Pistol, being the Jack of All Trades Master of None weapon for Halo 2. It fires in 3 round bursts, dishing out 6 damage per bullet using the Bullet Fast damage model. Bullet Fast is almost the exact same as Bullet Slow, with the differences being a better matchup into Brutes and a worse matchup into Flood. The wait time between each burst is 0.26 seconds, and the spread for each burst ranges from 0.3 degrees to 0.6 degrees. Its ammo capacity is 36 rounds per magazine, giving it 12 trigger pulls before reloading, followed by 108 spare rounds maximum. It's no secret that the Battle Rifle is one of the best guns in the game. Its consistency as a headshot machine is unmatched, capable of decimating whole squads of unshielded enemies with zero effort. It accomplishes this with more bullet magnetism compared to Halo 1's pistol, along with a 3 round burst granting 3 chances to land a headshot. The battle rifle is pretty decent into the shields of nearly every elite rank in the game. Since each burst dishes out 18 damage total, it's not too far off from the Halo 1's 20 damage per shot versus elite shields. This is significant because the shield values for Halo 2's elites are lower than Halo 1's meaning it takes less shots for a BR to break their shields. I wouldn't waste your time versus Ultras, however, unless you have a plaza pistol in your back pocket. Speaking of which, the battle rifle is the peanut butter to the plaza pistol's jelly. Together, they form the infamous noob combo. The plaza pistol takes out the shield, while the battle rifle kills with the headshot. This strategy is crucial on levels that predominantly feature elites. While drones can't be headshotted in Halo 2, it takes 3 bursts to kill one as long as all of your projectiles land. Jackals can be headshotted, while one burst to their hand will ping them, making them vulnerable to a headshot. Despite resisting body shots, combat forms can be headshotted by shooting their infection form region. It's not as good into sentinels as other options, but if you have the ammo to spare, it'll do alright. Just avoid the enforcer. I'd also avoid hunters. While the BR's projectiles are twice as effective into Hunter Flesh, it'll still take over a magazine to kill one, and that's assuming all of your shots land. In High Charity, it's possible to fight Brutes with a battle rifle, and if you're 100% accurate, two bursts to their helmet are enough to kill them. However, this won't work against Honor Guard Brutes, as their helmets can't be shot off. While the battle rifle is a top tier weapon, it does have a pretty major drawback. It's reserve ammo capacity. 108 is not a lot for the BR, since it fires in 3 round bursts. This just gives the weapon a total of 4 magazines to work with, including the one loaded. Thankfully, ammo for the weapon is common, at least during the first half of the game within the Master Chief levels, with it being found in ammo caches or in the hands of marines. That being said, there's stretches of time where ammo is limited, so making your shots count is key. The BR is also pretty decent into the hands of friendly AI, occasionally getting headshot kills for you and chipping at elite shields from far away. I'll be placing the battle rifle firmly in S tier. It's one of the most consistent weapons in the game, and will be your workhorse during a legendary run. The absolute opposite is true for our next weapon, the Magnum. It's another precision weapon for the UNSC, but it stands out as being a dual wieldable weapon capable of killing with headshots. It also has no dual wield penalties outside of a slow reload, with damage and accuracy being unaffected. It synergizes well with the dual wieldable plasma weapons since they can break shields for it. It also has a fast fire rate, with a fire recovery time of just a tenth of a second, and its single wield reload speed is among the fastest in the game. All of that sounds good, right? Mm, no. The Magnum is hot dog water. Despite the things I just said about it, there really is no reason to use this over the battle rifle or other precision weapons. Its paltry 8 damage per shot means it has to have assistance if it wants to take on elites, with the battle rifle out damaging it considerably. Sure, it can kill grunts and jackals with a single headshot, but even here it's painfully outclassed. It lacks a scope to take elites on from a distance, and it has the widest firing spread of any precision weapon in Halo 2. 
ranging from 0.25 degrees minimum to 1.5 degrees maximum. This makes the Magnum suck at ranged combat, and even in closer ranges, it's easier to use the battle rifle. Its ability to quickly kill elites while dual wielding a plasma weapon isn't even a good defense for it. The noob combo is plenty fast on its own while giving the player the ability to throw grenades. There is zero reason for you to risk yourself by using this thing at its intended range on Legendary, when it's much safer to use the game's other precision weapons at a safer distance. It's not even good in friendly AI hands. Yes, it can occasionally headshot enemies, but the BR can do this much better, and it does pathetic damage to larger enemies. The most damning thing about the Magnum is how oddly rare it is compared to the SMG and Battle Rifle, appearing the most often in the hands of Flood combat forms. How can a weapon this bad be so hard to find at the same time? It's the hipster headshot weapon and nothing more, and will be the sole resident of the Y tier. Why would you use this? Why does it exist? I don't know, just don't. The next weapon is our first Covenant option, the Plaza Pistol. It's in many ways a downgrade from its CE counterpart. It can't fire as fast as the player can pull a trigger anymore. Its standard bolts travel slower in the air, eat up more battery per shot, and do significantly less damage than before. So low, in fact, that it's borderline useless as a killing option. The damage model the standard bolt uses is Plasma Slow. It's notable for its 50% damage boost to energy shields. It's also four times effective into Sentinel Aggressors, and two times effective into Sentinel Enforcers and Hunters. However, it does 50% less damage to Brutes and the Flood, and 65% less damage to unshielded elites. Its overcharge shot also takes up significantly more battery per shot, and it's now only capable of heavily damaging energy shields. This is thanks to the combination of the overcharge bolt's one damage per shot and its EMP damage model, which does 500 times damage to energy shields and sentinels, 50 times damage to enforcers, and zero times damage into almost everything else, rendering them immune to the overcharge shot. Fun fact, one of the materials that takes neutral damage from EMP is hard metal thin, which is what unshielded elites use. Grunts and Jackals, on the other hand, use soft organic, which are immune to EMP. This means elites can die from the overcharge shot if their health is low enough, while Grunts and Jackals can't. This sounds like I'm bashing the Plaza Pistol pretty bad, but it's still a highly viable weapon in the campaign. It plays very differently from its CE counterpart. It now does one thing, and one thing only. Strip energy shields with the overcharge shot. It helps that the tracking received a major buff, to the point where it never misses its target. Elite shields, jackal shields, and sentinels alike cannot escape this thing's wrath. Overcharge shots also force elites to stagger upon being hit, which makes them vulnerable to an easy headshot. As a dual wieldable weapon, an advantage it has compared to the SMG and Magnum is that its overheat animation is the same speed as its single wielded variant. The Plaza Pistol's biggest problem is it's pretty useless outside of shield stripping especially during the later levels in the game. It's not good into Flood at all, and it's even worse into Brutes. There's no reason to use the Plaza Pistol for the last three levels of the game unless you want to strip Jackal Shields, which isn't all that necessary. You'd think the Plaza Pistol would be an awesome weapon to give your friend the AI, but it's one of the worst options in the game. Almost none of the AI actually use the Overcharge feature, except for the handful of Jackals you get on Sacred Icon. For these reasons, I'll be placing the Plaza Pistol in A tier. Its utility for helping to kill elites is unmatched, and is necessary for efficient runs on Legendary. However, outside of Sentinels and Shielded Jackals, it's bad into everything else, and it's not a good weapon to give to your allies. The standard Plasma Rifle is found alongside the Plaza Pistol. It got some nerfs after CE as well. Its projectiles travel slower in the air, relegating the Plasma Rifle to be better suited for close-range fights. Its damage, which uses the Plasma Slow model, was also reined back after becoming a dual-wieldable weapon. The good news is, the Plasma Rifle did receive some buffs. It's a lot more accurate with automatic fire. Its battery consumption is more efficient, offering 200 extra shots, and it no longer receives a rate of fire penalty as its battery drains. While dual-wielding and firing both weapons at the same time, its spread ranges from 1.5 degrees 
the 3 degrees, and it deals 25% less damage. It has a build-up fire rate from 6 rounds per second to 7.5 rounds per second. If you repeatedly press the trigger while firing automatically, you can cause an exploit that allows the plasma rifle to shoot even faster, increasing DPS. I used to be a Halo 2 plasma rifle hater back in the day, but I actually find this weapon to be underrated, even if it's a shell of its Halo 1 self. It's a plasma weapon that can also kill things on its own, most notably grunts, jackals, drones if you can catch them lacking, and especially sentinels with its 4 times effectiveness versus them. Even hunters are slaughtered by dual plasma rifles. Dual plasma rifles in general are actually fairly solid. At close range, firing both effectively gives you a 50% damage boost versus firing just one. You could fire one plasma rifle at a time for consistent damage on targets. As one overheats, your other rifle can keep firing, and the overheat animation time doesn't change while dual wielding. The plasma rifle is also one of the few dual wield weapons that works well single wielded. It does good damage on its own, especially while spamming the trigger, and combos well with grenades and melee attacks. Even into elite armor, which has a 65% damage resistance against plasma slow, it's still fairly decent since enough shots will make the elite stagger. The plasma rifle is surprisingly good in the hands of friendly AI. They provide great shield chip and do excellent damage into grunts and jackals. The AI can fire these faster than the player can shoot as well, at a max of 9 rounds per second. Something I don't hear a lot of people talk about is how useful the plasma rifle can be when attacking wraiths. It has a high damage transfer value versus vehicles, and since they primarily have elite pilots, their shields are knocked out fairly quickly. All that being said, the plasma rifle has its drawbacks. It's not as consistent as the plasma pistol overcharge at draining elite shields, making the latter the preferred choice for efficient runs. Like the plasma pistol, it begins to lose value in levels that don't have elites as the primary enemy, being weak versus brutes and flood forms. While it does have good dual wield partners such as the SMG, Magnum, and even another plasma rifle, dual wielding does limit your combat options since you lack grenades and your melees drop one of your weapons. I've been hyping up the plasma rifle as a good damage dealer, but it's still outdone by the precision weapons when they have the ammo to spare. Overall, a solid B-tier weapon. Like I said, it's underrated and worth exploring, but its drawbacks do bring it down a fair amount, and other options are more consistent. We move on to the grenades, which you find in the first hangar. I'll start with the frag grenade. It got some buffs from Halo 1. It's now capable of air bursting. Once it hits any surface, and not just when it's resting on the ground, its half a second arm timer will start. It has also received a damage boost from CE, using the new Explosion Small damage model. Explosion Small is neutral to everything except energy shields, which has a 50% damage resistance, and solid armor targets like Wraiths and Hunters, which have a 75% damage resistance. The frag grenade did receive a sizable blast radius nerf, however, which prevents this grenade from being the unshielded squad wiper it was in Halo 1. It doesn't have the double damage boost into Flood, only being neutrally effective, but frags and any explosives in general are now capable of blowing up combat forms into pieces, preventing infection forms from reviving them. You can also use frag grenades while boarding wraiths. Once the hatch is broken off, you can slam a grenade in there, heavily damaging or outright killing the driver. The frags are solid A tier. Not as destructive as their CE counterparts, but they're still extremely helpful, especially since they don't take up a weapon slot. The other grenade is the plasma grenade. Out of the two grenades, the plasma got hit the hardest with nerfs after Halo 1. It has the same explosion damage value from Halo 1's plasma nades, unlike the frags which got slightly stronger. The kicker is that it lost the EMP effect it once had, meaning it's way worse into energy shields than before. Since it uses the explosion's small damage model, plasma grenade explosions do half damage to shields. It also received a blast radius nerf on top of this. If you miss a stick, that's a lot of value lost. That being said, the plasma grenade is still very powerful when you do land sticks, which aren't that difficult to do compared to multiplayer. It's particularly easy to stick elites and brutes thanks to their wide bodies. Plasma grenade sticks deal 400 damage, killing elites and brutes with just one stick. The one exception is the Elite Ultra, which barely survives a plasma stick, but it can sometimes make them berserk and pull a sword out, making them easier to deal with at range. 
Plasma grenades are also much more common than frags, being dropped by nearly every grunt and brute in the game, as well as some elites and flood combat forms. Once again, you can use plasma grenades to aid in wraith boarding, but plasma grenades also have more anti-vehicle utility. Not only do plasma grenades detonate combat form bodies, but if you time it right, they can destroy the infection forms at the same time the carrier form explodes. This happens in Halo 1 as well, but I forgot to include it in that tier list. Another solid A tier option, right ahead of frag grenades. They're more common than frags, and have devastating kill power when stuck to targets, but missing a stick results in much worse damage output than CE's plasma nades. On Legendary, the last squad to appear in the first hangar are two Grunt Ultras and an Elite Ultra. The Grunts are carrying Needlers, and that's up next. You're not prepared for what I have to say about the Needler. Its magazine size is 30 needles, with a maximum of 90 in reserve, which doubles to 180 when dual wielding. It fires at a flat rate of 7.5 needles per second, slightly slower than the Halo 1 Needler's maximum rate of 10. This makes the Halo 2 Needler unique as it's the only one in the series without a built-up fire rate. Its projectile velocity got a slight buff from Halo 1, although it's still very slow. The Needler has four damage effects tied to it. First is the Direct Impact, which just does one damage using Plasma Slow. There's the Shard Detonation, which does two points of damage using Plasma Slow. There's the Area of Effect Super Combined Damage, which deals 30 to 50 points of explosion small damage with a radius of 0.5 world units. Lastly, there's the Attached Super Combined Damage, which deals 400 points of explosion small damage. So, the Halo 2 Needler? It's good. So many people write this weapon off, mainly for how horrible it is in multiplayer, but it's actually pretty good in the campaign. Single wielded it's... okay. The slow rate of fire and slow projectiles do drag the viability of the Needler down, but it's not entirely useless. Two Needlers, however, is where the magic happens. It's the best dual wield combo in the game by far, decimating almost everything that can be super combined. While dual wielding, you just need to hear the firing sound four times to know that you shot enough needles to trigger a super combine. Berserking Brutes and Energy Sword Elites run straight at you, making them especially vulnerable to the Pink Death. The Needler is especially good into combat forms since super combines detonate their bodies. Sentinels are weak to just the Needles themselves. Since the Needles dish out Plasma slow damage, they're four times effective into Sentinels, so you can miss a few and still do solid damage to them. What makes the Needler unique as a dual wield option is it's a magazine-fed weapon that doesn't have a slow reload speed, unlike the SMG in Magnum. I don't want my bias to get in the way though. The Needler has serious drawbacks that weigh it down. Its slow projectile velocity could be a hindrance at longer ranges, giving enemies enough time to dodge them or take cover. Dual Needlers being as strong as they are is both a blessing and a curse. The fact that you need to dual wheel to reap the rewards prevents you from throwing grenades, and when you melee something, you're heavily nerfing yourself by dropping one of your Needlers. While dual Needlers are awesome, it has negative synergy with the other dual wield options in the game. Nothing about a Needler is improved when pairing it with anything else. Needlers are oddly bad into Hunters, which barely take any damage from Super Combines. Shielded Jackals require the player to get around their shield. Ammo is notably scarce compared to the Plaza Pistol and Plasma Rifle, with the exception of the two Heretic missions where almost all the Heretic Grunts use Needlers. Lastly, the Needler makes for a poor option for friendly AI. While they can Super Combine things, there's more consistent options for them, and you can't make them dual wield needlers unless your elite ally is already dual wielding something else. Overall, a B tier weapon. One of the few weapons from CE that got noticeably buffed for the single player environment. That being said, the fact you need to dual wield the needler to be effective does bring its viability down considerably, and it has issues with consistency due to its slow projectile velocity. Going back to that ultra squad in the hangar, you could force the elite to berserk and pull out an energy sword and that's next on our list. The Energy Sword is a pure melee weapon that uses two damage effects. The standard melee dishes out 70 points of damage using the Cutting Damage model. This makes the sword neutrally effective into Elites and Brutes, twice as effective against Grunts, Jackals, and Drones, and quadruply effective into the Flood. The second damage effect is for its Lunge Attack, which dishes out 150 points of Cutting Damage. 
The range for the sword's lunge attack is 8 world units, giving the weapon a decent amount of range for a CQB option. It uses up 10% of its battery with each kill, except for the Flood and Sentinel aggressors, where only 2.5% is used with each kill. Each swing of the sword forces a hard ping, staggering enemies that get hit. When the sword's battery is depleted, the blade will vanish, leaving just the hilt as a weak melee option. This is my favorite energy sword in the entire series. You can immediately swing it and deal damage at the exact moment you switch to the sword. The energy sword is THE best anti-flood weapon in the game. Not only does it one-hit kill every combat form, it slices their body to pieces at a drastically reduced battery cost. Even against elites, you can lunge at them once to weaken their shield, then finish them off with another weapon. A value that I haven't brought up yet is scariness. Certain weapons in Halo 2 can instill fear into their enemies, triggering them to take cover more often or even flee for their lives. For example, for an elite to take cover from the player using a certain weapon, the scariness value has to exceed 6, and for grunts to flee at the sight of you, it has to exceed 14. The energy sword has the highest scariness value in the game, with a value of 16. When the AI notices you have a sword, they'll respect you, and most notably, it makes dealing with elite ultras easier. When they see you brandish a sword, they'll berserk, drop their plasma rifle, and pull out their own sword making them easier to deal with at range. While the energy sword is a formidable weapon, it has considerable weaknesses. The nature of it being a melee option, even with its long lunge attack, limits it to being a close range only option. You can sword fly, but I won't include it as a trait for the ranking as it's an advanced trick that I don't see a lot of people using. While a 2.5% battery per sentinel kill seems tempting, I wouldn't advise it on legendary. Killing a sentinel this way will deplete your shields, leaving you vulnerable. It can't do anything to hunters, not even damaging its backside, and enforcers are a no-go as well. You can only give the energy sword to allied elites in Halo 2, and to be honest, sword elites in this game suck. They have no chance against ranged enemies, and their movements are predictable. They often miss their swings too. The energy sword is a strong A-tier weapon. Its utility against the flood is extremely important, and is arguably the best close quarters weapon in the game. However, being a close range only weapon limits what it can do for you. It can be rare at times, and it's a bad ally weapon. The last weapon you find on Cairo Station is the shotgun, and how the mighty have fallen. If you remember my Halo 1 tier list, the shotgun was the apex predator of Halo 1's campaign, but Halo 2's shotgun is nowhere close to its predecessor's strength. The Halo 2 shotgun shoots less pellets than Halo 1's, and each pellet does less damage on top of that. It's the effective range that was severely neutered, and is now only capable of doing major damage at point-blank range. The pellet's damage also begins to fall off after traveling 5 world units, so shooting too far from your target will result in damage loss. The shotgun's damage effect is our first instance of one using two damage models at the same time. Bullet slow, and Kill Flood. As the name suggests, Kill Flood is notable for being two times effective versus the Flood and neutral versus everything else. When a damage effect has two damage models, the game multiplies the values that are set for both of them. Bullet Slow has a 1.25 times effectiveness versus Flood, so 1.25 times 2 is 2.5, which is the final multiplier. While the shotgun can still load 12 shells in this game, it carries less reserve shells than in Halo 1, down to 36 from the original 60, and the reload speed is noticeably slower as well. I've been doom and gloom about the shotgun, but it's not all bad. While the energy sword is the better flood slayer, the shotgun is still a good alternative, even being able to blow apart human combat forms, but not the elite forms. The fact the shotgun can two-shot hunters would be a notable niche over the energy sword, but such an interaction only comes up once, during the underwater segment of Regret. Shotguns are pretty good NPC options, particularly in places with tight corridors. I'll give the shotgun a B placement. It can be powerful at times, but it has consistency issues due to its poor range and damage drop off. When we start on outskirts, Johnson is holding our next weapon, the sniper rifle. It's received quite a few nerfs from its CE incarnation. It can hold one less magazine in reserve, and its damage output is considerably weaker. This matters when going up against grunt majors and jackals, 
since they all require two body shots to drop. Even elite miners require two shots to break their shields, compared to CE where only one was needed. The first zoom level has also been changed from CE, now at a 5 times magnification from CE's 2 times. This makes the weapon a bit harder to use in closer ranges than before. While this all sounds bad in theory, the sniper rifle is still a very powerful option. I made it seem like two-shotting elites was a bad thing, but CE's sniper rifle was already doing this versus majors anyway. 20 rounds in reserve is also still a lot of ammo for the sniper's power level, and the 2 rounds per second fire rate is still intact in Halo 2. Its reload speed is faster than CE's as well, especially after YYing. The sniper's projectiles use two damage models, Bullet Fast and Sniper. Sniper is notable for being four times effective versus Hunters, and two times effective versus Elite Energy Shields. The Hunter matchup deserves another mention because Bullet Fast is also two times effective versus Hunters. It's not one-shotting them like in Halo 1, but a two-shot kill is still excellent. While a sniper rifle is bad versus Flood Flesh, their attached infection form now serves as a headshot region, allowing the sniper to one-shot them. It's also much better into Sentinels than CE, three-shotting the Eliminator and two-shotting the other two ranks. While a sniper rifle two-shots most enemies to the body, it'll one-shot drones, making it one of the best options versus them. Each round of the sniper rifle forces a hard ping as well, stunning enemies in place as they're getting sniped. Sniper rifles are also neat anti-ghost weapons. A shot to their circular generator will destroy it. This weapon is phenomenal in the hands of friendly AI. They provide great support against long-distance targets, hard pinging them or just headshotting them to death. The sniper rifle is A-tier for me. Despite many of the nerfs after Halo 1, it's got its fair share of indirect buffs as well, being viable against enemies that wasn't before like Flood and Sentinels. What keeps it from going any higher with an A is its near-complete disappearance after Regret, only briefly appearing in the hands of combat forms on Quarantine Zone and High Charity. The weapon used by the notorious Jackal Snipers is up next, the Beam Rifle. Take everything I said about the Sniper Rifle, apply it to the Beam Rifle, Make this weapon exponentially more common than the sniper rifle, and give it a battery. Not only is it the most common power weapon in the game, but it's also more efficient at dealing consistent damage than the sniper rifle. You can fire this weapon twice as fast as the sniper rifle. However, spamming the trigger will cause you to overheat your beam rifle due to generating 65 points of heat out of 100 per shot. If you pace your shots though, you won't overheat, which is a huge advantage over reloadable magazines. It uses up 5.5% of its battery per shot, giving it 18 shots to work with. That's less than the sniper rifle's maximum capacity, but more often than not, you'll find more beam rifles than the sniper rifle, with more available shots than the sniper rifle typically grants. A small advantage that the beam rifle has over the sniper rifle is the damage model it uses alongside sniper, plasma fast. It's almost the exact same as bullet fast, but it does double damage to Sentinels and the Enforcers, and deals half damage to Jackal Shields as opposed to zero damage. This allows the Beam Rifle to one-shot unshielded Sentinels, and two-shot the other two ranks. It can also shoot off the Enforcer's weapon and shield generators much more easily than the Sniper Rifle can. Since everything else about the Beam Rifle is the same as the Sniper Rifle, I'll end my analysis for it here, and give it the S tier it deserves. It's a power weapon that's almost as common as standard weapons, and it's a powerful option that decimates pretty much every relevant enemy in the game. Right before entering the tunnels on outskirts, we find the Rocket Launcher. While its damage output was reduced from Halo 1, many of its matchups remain the same as they did thanks to Halo 2's elites being less tanky. It also uses a second damage effect, an impact effect that deals 150 extra damage to enemies hit directly. Both of the Rocket's damage effects use the Explosion Large damage model, while it does half damage to energy shields, it's neutral into everything else, including heavily armored targets like wraiths and hunters. It has a blast radius of two world units, letting it decimate large groups of enemies with one blast. Rockets in Halo 2 are much faster than CEs, starting at 8 world units per second and building up to 20. The most important buff is its new vehicle tracking ability. This makes the rocket launcher exponentially more consistent at being an anti-vehicle weapon than its predecessor. This feature actually allows the weapon to lock onto enforcers, since they're counted as vehicles in the game's tag system. The rocket launcher is also one of the best countermeasures to phantom turrets. You can lock onto each of their turrets if you want, 
but a well-placed shot directly in the belly can destroy all three at once. The biggest issue the rocket launcher faces is limited ammo. However, that is partially solved by giving it to your allies. This is arguably the best weapon to give to your friendly NPCs. They spam the hell out of this thing, decimating everything in their path, and they even use the lock-on feature against vehicles. Giving a marine your rocket launcher while you drive a warthog is akin to adding a missile launcher to the hog itself. It just makes your squad so much stronger. They also have a rule of engagement when it comes to range. If enemies get too close, they'll refuse to fire the weapon in fear of the blast radius. To me, the rocket launcher is A tier. It's a devastating beast, destroying everything in its path. But ammo can be limited, and you need to ensure your allied NPCs survive to get the most out of it. We won't see a new weapon until the first Arbiter mission. In the hands of heretic elites, there's the Carbine. The Covenant counterpart to the battle rifle, it's a precision mid-range weapon that fires in single shots. It deals 11 points of plasma fast damage per shot, and its fire recovery time is 0.14 seconds. It holds 18 slugs per magazine, and it can hold a maximum of 72 spare slugs. This gives the user 5 total magazines to work with, including the one loaded. Some missions grant you a few extra reserve slugs, such as Sacred Icon and High Charity. It has a pretty wide firing spread for a precision weapon, ranging from 0.3 degrees to 0.6 degrees. The Carbine is just as impactful to the campaign as the Battle Rifle is. It's a second jack-of-all-trades weapon, being viable in a wide range of scenarios. I would even go so far as to say the difference in viability between the two rifles is not that different. The Battle Rifle has the 3 round burst granting more headshot opportunities and being easier to use, but the Carbine has its own advantages. Its plasma fast damage model gives it a better matchup into Sentinels and Jackal Shields in the BR. With the Carbine having 18 rounds per magazine and being a single shot weapon, it has more trigger pulls per magazine than the Battle Rifle, which only has 12 due to burst firing. The BR can kill more than one grunt per burst, but that doesn't happen a whole lot. The Carbine is more ammo efficient in my opinion, especially since players can carry one more magazine for the Carbine as well. The Carbine does become the face of the game during the last four levels, as BRs are either non-existent or become scarce, with only a handful appearing on high charity. The noob combo is nearly as effective with the Carbine as it is with the Battle Rifle. There is one major downside to the Carbine though, and it's the accuracy. It uses the exact same spread values as the BR, despite not being a burst weapon, and this can make taking on faraway jackal snipers tough. The Carbine is our third S rank right next to the Battle Rifle. It's been tricky to determine which I feel is more viable than the other, but I have to give the edge to the Battle Rifle. The Carbine has its advantages over the BR, but some of those advantages are situational, and the BR is much easier to use. That being said, the Carbine is still excellent and a highly consistent weapon, and when the BR is not around, the Carbine will definitely be in your hands. When approaching the Heretic Hangar, we come across our first group of Sentinels, along with the Sentinel Beams they carry. The Sentinel Beam is a direct energy weapon that dishes out 60 damage per second. It uses two damage models, Plasma Fast and Anti-Flood. Anti-Flood is a lot like the shotgun's Kill Flood model, but grants a 6x damage boost to Flood instead. However, because Plasma Fast is only half effective versus Flood, the Sentinel Beam ends up with a 3 times effectiveness versus Flood. It uses up 9% of its battery for every second the trigger is held. It takes about 3 seconds to overheat. It's a common weapon on levels it's featured in, mostly used by Sentinels, but will occasionally be used by Heretic Elites and Flood combat forms. It's good into Sentinels and the Enforcers thanks to using Plasma Fast as well. I'm gonna be honest, this weapon isn't that great. It's only effective versus specific enemies, and not good into most others. Even into the enemies it's good versus, there's better options such as the Carbine, Energy Sword, and Shotgun. The Sentinel Beam is really bad into Heretic Elites, with the Beam not doing a lot of shield damage and takes too long to kill Heretic Grunts. Just like the Energy Sword, you can only give the Sentinel Beam to allied elites, and it's not very good in their hands. Since there's not much else to say about the Sentinel Beam, I'll rank it in C. It can work sometimes, but is highly situational and has terrible matchups versus important enemies. 
Once your allies get dropped off in the hangar, some heretic grunts appear wielding fuel rod cannons. It's an explosive power weapon, shooting 5 rounds before reloading. It can carry 25 in reserve. It fires slightly faster than the rocket launcher, with a fire recovery time of 0.4 seconds. The projectile velocity starts at 15 world units per second, then gradually slows down to 6.5. On direct impact, it deals 100 damage of explosion large damage. In the area of effect detonation, this is out 90 points of explosion large wa damage with a blast radius of 1.5 world units. That's not a typo on my end, by the way. That's what it says in the damage tag. Whoever edited the tag accidentally misspelled explosion large. The explosion damage is supposed to do half damage to energy shields, but since explosion large wa does not exist in the damage table, it defaults to being neutral against everything in the game. Rockets do 170 damage to shields after the multipliers, while the fuel rod does 140. This, along with its more than double magazine size and faster fire rate compared to the rocket launcher, makes the fuel rod extremely above curve against infantry. Giving the fuel rod to an ally activates a feature exclusive to NPCs. It tracks enemies, including infantry units. This somewhat helps them deal with the slow projectile velocity, although many shots still miss compared to the rocket launcher. To be honest, the rocket launcher is just a better pick to give to allies. Magazine sizes don't apply to NPCs, and rockets travel much faster in the air than fuel rods. The biggest issue the fuel rod faces is its rarity. It's only seen a handful of times throughout the campaign, with its biggest showing being the first Arbiter level. Once you get a Banshee, all the Heretic Grunts use Fuel Rod Cannons. You can stockpile ammo and bring the Fuel Rod with you to Oracle, but it'll be the only Fuel Rod you get on this level. After that, it's only seen occasionally on Regret, Gravemind, and Uprising. The Fuel Rod is our top B placement. It's devastatingly strong thanks to that damage effect oversight, However, it's one of the rarest weapons in the game, limiting its usage. Once we reach Sacred Icon, we come across the first of two weapon variants, the Eliminator Sentinel Beam. It's nearly identical to the regular Sentinel Beam, except for its damage, heat generation per second, and battery drainage per second. Even though 3 damage is only slightly higher than 2, it matters a great deal. Both variants fire at a rate of 30 rounds per second, meaning the standard version deals 60 damage per second, while the Eliminator deals 90. The Eliminator Beam is an upgrade to the regular Sentinel Beam in every way, although it can be harder to use since it overheats and drains its battery more quickly. On Sacred Icon specifically, the Eliminator is rare, with only a handful of Eliminator Sentinels appearing. However, it's much more common on Quarantine Zone, appearing more often than the normal version. I'll be placing the Eliminator Beam at the top of C, it's much better than the regular Sentinel Beam, but is still vastly outclassed by other weapons. The Carbine, for example, is still the preferred choice to quickly kill Sentinels, as well as flood with headshots, while the Energy Sword remains the best anti-flood weapon in the game. That being said, it's a decent weapon in its own right, and is a good alternative when the more viable weapons have little ammo. With the introduction of the Brutes, our second weapon variant, the Brute Plasma Rifle, makes an appearance. Everything about the weapon, except its fire rate, is the same as the standard plasma rifle. Some people believe it deals more damage than the blue one, and while the brute plasma rifle does have a higher DPS, it's not true. Each bolt deals the exact same damage as the regular versions. Since everything else about the weapon is the same as the original, I'll just get to the point. The brute plasma rifle couldn't have been introduced at a worse time in the campaign. The main enemies from this point on are brutes which resist Plasma Slow. Outside of the handful of elites that appear on Gravemind, as well as shielded combat forms, the Brute Plasma Rifle is mostly a fish out of water. It can still kill Grunts and Jackals fairly well, but shortly after the first few enemies on Gravemind spawn, Brutes wielding Carbines appear and immediately outclass this weapon. I even find the regular Plasma Rifle easier to use, considering how prone to overheating the Brute variant is. I think this weapon is low C tier. At this point in the game, it just doesn't do anything notable. I almost put this in Y tier, but it can at least do well against the few elites and hunters you find on Gravemind, and it can kill grunts pretty quickly. Our final weapon is the Brute Shot. It's a brute grenade launcher with a bayonet, showcasing quite a few unique traits. 
It carries 4 grenades per reload cycle and 12 in reserve. Its fire recovery time is 0.3 seconds. Its projectile velocity is initially 20 world units per second, eventually reaching 10 world units per second. It has two damage effects. Direct impact deals 20 damage of bullet fast, while explosions deal 25 to 50 damage of explosion small, with a blast radius of 1.5 world units. The brute shot is unique in that it deals more melee damage than other firearms. It uses the same melee damage as the fast energy sword swings, dealing 70 cutting damage. While the brute plasma rifle was introduced at a terrible time in the campaign, the opposite is true for the brute shot. It's perfectly suited for taking on brutes. The grenades deal solid damage to them while halting their berserk charges, and while you don't want to be close to brutes, the brute shot's melee attack deals great damage to them, killing them in 3 to 4 hits. The melee is also unique in that it destroys combat form bodies. I'd say that the brute shot's melee is so useful that even if you run out of ammo, you can get away with keeping it as a bootleg energy sword that never runs out of battery. The Brute Shot is one of the best anti-jackal squad weapons in the game since the grenades bypass their shields. There are some pretty sizable drawbacks to this weapon though. Its limited ammo is a major one. While the Brute Shot is decently common on levels it appears in, you'll often run out of ammo before you find an ammo cache or another Brute using it. Normally, giving your low ammo weapon to an ally is a way to bypass ammo shortage, but Marines on Gravemind cannot be given the Brute Shot. It can only be given to allied elites, and while it's pretty decent in their hands, it's nothing special. Its reload speed is relatively slow compared to other weapons, even with the YY cancel. Its range is also fairly limited. The grenades travel slowly in the air, and they're heavily affected by gravity compared to other projectiles. Lastly, for an explosive weapon, it's not great into vehicles, not even doing well into ghosts other than flipping them occasionally. I'll give our final weapon a bottom A ranking. It has amazing qualities, most notably its strong melee attack, and is a great anti-brute choice. However, its low ammo capacity, slow projectile velocity, and slow reload speed do hold it back from going any higher. And that's going to be it with the single player rankings for Halo 2's weapons. In part 2, we'll move on to the multiplayer component, and see how the game's weapons fare there. Let me know your thoughts on my rankings and even post your own in the comments below. If, and only if, you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe for more Halo content from this channel, and ring the bell to never miss an upload. I'd like to thank my patrons, as well as my Needler Gang YouTube members, for further supporting the channel. Your voluntary patronage is highly appreciated. This is The Ventral Vatum. Always remember that you matter more than you think you do, and I'll see you on the great journey.